-hmm. Fortunately, I was here first. <laughs> Welcome, Roberta. We're a few minutes early here. Hi, Simi. How are you? Long time no see. Hello, how are you? Hi. You're early, just like the rest of us. <laughs> Yeah, okay, it's just nine o'clock. That's uh... really oh, it's nine o'clock where you are. Yes, it's eight o'clock here. Okay, sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I will close. No problem. You you ate your meal. I had my dinner. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, so I will come one hour later. So no, 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 no. You're at, you're you're at the right time. The time is always the time is always a big problem because uh, everybody's uh, joining from different time zones, and of course we have daylight savings times as well. So it's always hard for me to come up with a good way to tell people what time it is. So I hope more people will be joining. Yeah, because uh, always it was nine o'clock with my time. Your time. Yeah, so eight o'clock with your time. Yeah. Okay, so. And for Stephanie, who can't be here, it's two o'clock in the morning when she's in China, but she's coming to uh, England tomorrow, but she can't be there to, she can't be here tonight because her flight got delayed. Mm. Okay. And oh. so I hope Rawl is going to show up as well. I haven't heard anything from him. Nicholas okay. should be here soon. How, oh, no, I, you just, even if in the, Together, I can listen. Don't worry. Oh, <laughs> good, good, good. But, if but, you like. <laughs> but this is going to be more interactive because uh, I'm going to be asking uh, people if they have any questions in the middle of the presentation and, and, instead of just at the end. So you don't have to be quiet all the time. Okay, that's mm -hmm. better. Yeah, I think so. Because always I forget, you know, you tell, you tell, I say, okay. But, but then afterwards, I just forget what to ask, what was the question, and then yeah, yeah. At the end, I do my comments, but that's better. In the yeah. Moment. Well, when, uh, who was it, uh, Leo and Alexander were giving their uh, presentation, I was actually sitting here taking notes because it was just so much, and I knew I was going to forget it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I hope we're not just the three of us. Roberto is quiet. Yeah, Roberto is a quiet type. <laughs> well, I think everyone knows about the difference between communism and RB. Probably the you think that's... so? I, I uh, have sincere doubts about that. Uh, really? Even, even I am right now learning about new things about RB yeah. that I didn't know before, but I, I search about it a lot. For example, the the distribution of the resources mm -hmm. will be by population to the cities and the cities will decide about it right so this is i mean completely total different from what is communism communism is ruled by the government yeah well i'm going to go into that ruled by the yeah, yeah 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 that's what people think that's what people think <laughs> <laughs> still i think like this that Communism no. is ruled by the government. No. No. Okay. No. <laughs> I mean, it became like this. It became fasc fascism because. Uh, but if if you you will explain me, just keep in mind that I am thinking like this because I. Yeah, heard, yeah, yeah. Uh, but that's what that's why I'm going to be starting out of, uh, the presentation because actually a lot of people have different ideas about. Uh, what communism really is. And so that's the first thing that you have to really get straight with people is uh, what you're talking about. Just with any kind of uh, scientific... Uh, ah, here come some people. Hello, everyone. I don't see anyone. <laughs> Everybody's incognito today. Hi, Tony. I'm here, Del. You can see me. I've got nothing to hide. Oh, good for you. 
Nobody has anything to hide, but some people just don't want to be seen, which I can completely understand. Uh, well, I didn't want to go on either. I mean, my hair is a mess. <laughs> <laughs> Bad hair day. <laughs> uh, I know the feeling. I used to have long blonde hair, you ah. know, past my shoulders. And now it, my hairline stops over here. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Poor Stephanie well, is, is, is stuck in Hong Kong today. So oh, she I didn't know. Join us. Yeah. She, uh, she, uh, she, at me, she messaged me this morning uh, that her flight got delayed for, for a day and uh, that for she wouldn't day. join us. Wow. Yeah. That's uh, a day. That's, that's a long time. Yeah. Well, I was expecting a few more people, but maybe we should just get started and see who jumps in. Is that an idea? Um, I, I'm good with anything. Uh, I'm looking forward to this one. Yeah. Well, uh, I hope you really are looking forward to it because it's quite long. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have expected anything less. <laughs> well, well, I'm I'm um, I'm going to try and uh, ease the burden by making it more interactive than our previous meetings. So instead of waiting for questions at the end, uh, I'm going to be taking them during the presentation. So, without any further ado, I think I'll just just get started and see what uh, what happens then. Yeah, so I'm going to share a screen, slideshow, uh, slideshow from current side. Okay, so as already mentioned, tonight I'm going to be talking about a comparison between communism and a resource based economy. And basically, these will bring, uh, lead to suggestions for informed discussion and for informed planning. Now, for those of you who don't know me or of my background, my name is Charlotte Wenner. I am a master's of education, also a certified counselor. Hi, Nicholas. Certified counselor, uh, which I mentioned because I will be uh, talking a bit about human behavior. So uh, I do have some education on that. And I am, perhaps most importantly, a former member of the RCP Maoist Party in the USA. Um, so basically what I'd like to talk about tonight is how knowledge of the similarities and differences between Marxism, communism, and a resource-based economy can provide resource-based economy supporters with valuable information for discussions with the public, for deeper understanding, and plans for the future. This is really an educational um, presentation and uh, I'm going to be going in deep in this, uh, but I think there has to be a lot more education for people because there's been a lot of propaganda going on for a long time. Now I'll start the presentation uh, with a definition of terms. This is extremely important in any kind of discussion you want to have about this subject. Anybody that wants to talk to you about communism and an RBE, you have to be really clear, well, what are we actually talking about? Then I'm going to go on to talk about communism. I'll be talking about the background, the principles, the goal, and the history of communism. And after that section, I want to talk briefly about things that can be learned, what worked, so what made them successful, uh, quote unquote, revolutions, and what didn't work. Then I'll take a brief look at the RBE, so the background principles, the goals, and history, and finish up with a comparison of the two. Finally, I want to talk about things in, this, in these comparisons that may uh, be important to think about when you have discussions with people about it. And uh, at the end, I'll be giving you a list of sources that I used for this presentation. Now, about these sources, I do want to say one thing. Uh, when I was younger and in the RCP, I read all the original works by 
by Marx, by Lenin, by Stalin, by Mao. I read them all, but that's a long time ago. So the theories, the concepts I have in my head, but I used Wikipedia to refresh my memory on the facts. So if you see Wikipedia in the sources, don't think, oh, <laughs> she, just, <laughs> she just got this from some cheap site. Uh, it's based on more my, my knowledge, but facts are not my strongest point. So what I really want to be clear about that the, at the end of this presentation, I hope that you will go away with uh, the understanding that, uh, which is, although there is the perhaps inconvenient truth that there are similarities between communism and the RBE, uh, this should not be seen as something to be defensive about, but rather as evidence that the scientific method has been applied to those social experiments in the past uh, in order to make a better, more workable system of holistic change, which is an RBE. Of course, uh, I do want to say that I am only a lay person. I know more about these subjects than a lot of people, but I'm not an expert. There are people that have done university studies on Marxism. There are people have, that, have, that have been with the RBE for tens and tens of years, and I am not one of them. However, I do have more understanding than most people on these subjects, which is why I chose to do this uh, presentation. It's all my own opinion and is based on my own research. Uh, as I mentioned, this is a long presentation. So at the end of each subject, I'm going to give you guys a chance to uh, ask questions if you've got them. Uh, this will make it more interactive. Uh, at the end of the pre presentations, I'd prefer to focus on uh, actual problems that you might have discussing these two things with people these subjects with people. Maybe we can help each other with how we can solve this, okay? Now, I was thinking of cutting this uh, presentation short. It's, it's pretty long, and I thought, oh, maybe I should just skip some sections. And then I saw this meme today on Facebook. And it says, did you know that Russian communism wasn't Russian at all? It was Jewish. Jewish Bolshevik communists invaded Russia in 1917 and mass murdered Russian Christians in a Jewish communist takeover. Eventually, more than 60 million people were slaughtered. Today, the Jewish media continues, continues to hide the fact that the communists were Jews. This is complete rubbish. Where did I see this in meme? Did I see this on the, the, the timeline of some right-wing anti-Zionist uh, fanatic? No, I saw it on the timeline of a TBP supporter. So I made the decision at that time to do the whole presentation. I'm gonna give you all the information I've got. I hope you can use it, tell other people about it, get some education going on among our friends. So as I mentioned, I want, yeah, Semi, you wanna say something? Yes, the, the previous slide, there was a beautiful girl. You must understand when you put beautiful girl, you know, they're trying to, it's not true. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's, that's, <laughs> thank you for raising that because I'm thinking, I mean, oh my God. It's not relevant with the topic. Perfect, perfect example of how capitalism, about how... Uh, Advertisement. We, yeah, we are manipulated by these images. And then they think, oh, communists were Jewish uh, people, Bolsheviks taking over the world. You know, it's, it's ridiculous. So when you're talking about these things with the people, the first thing you want to do is define your terms. Every analysis, every logical discussion has to be clear about what you exactly mean by the terms you use. And especially with the terms socialism and communism. There are tens and tens and tens of years that have been in, devoted to giving a negative image, negative propaganda about, about everything that is related to socialism and communism, especially in uh, the United States, but also in other parts of the West. It could also be that you 
have a personal negative reaction to these terms. Um, for, you might feel as soon as somebody says, well, they're the same, aren't they? That you get really worked up about it. And that means that your emotions are kicking in. Now, there's a personal example I wanted to mention about how this works. I was talking to a TVP friend uh, about myself, and I told him, well, I have dual nationality. I have Dutch nationality, but I was born and raised in the United States. And he said just offhand, oh, fuck the USA. I immediately noticed that I contracted, that I, that I had a negative response. And I wanted to say, what do you mean, fuck the USA? Just because we have a ridiculous president doesn't mean that we're idiots. But I, I kept my mouth shut because I realized, oh, this is just my conditioning kicking in. All those years of being told that USA is number one, love your land or leave it, all that stuff, it's in my subconscious. So every time somebody says something like that, I have a negative reaction. The same thing can happen to you when somebody says, oh, but aren't socialism and communism and the RBE the same? If you feel yourself getting defensive, then you have to know there's something there. Now, this conditioning can really stand in the way to having an objective, reasonable conversation. So that's why I suggest if you notice this is something that you have, to work on it, to be aware of that when you get into these discussions. But besides all that, correctly identifying what you mean by communism is going to be a great practical help when you discuss this. Now in this presentation, I'm going to be using the definition of communism as was outlined in Marx's works on economics and the Communist Manifesto in particular. Now, the thing that makes it difficult is that Marx himself talked about three different forms of communism. He talked about primitive communism, which was what tribes practiced in the pre-Neolithic uh, uh, era, uh, about 12,500 12, years ago. And I'm not going to be using it in the second way Marx defined communism, which was uh, a sort of transition state or socialism which had the dictatorship of the proletariat through a government. These were two other forms of communism but not the ultimate communism that Marx actually stood for. I'm also not talking about the communist state as it is defined by the USSR or has been since Khrushchev and in China uh, since the time of Mao. So it's important if you discuss that to let people know, well, I'm not talking about Russia, I'm not talking about China, I'm not talking about any of those earlier forms, I'm talking about what Marx set out in Das Kapital and the Communist Manifesto. The definition of resource economy may seem uh, obvious to you, but I do want to make it clear, and it, I'll be using the definition as particularly outlined by Jacques Fresco and advocated by the Venus Project and the Zeitgeist Movement. I'm not going to be talking about the resource-based economy as it is handled in smaller groups or transition societies such as one small town, etc. And I'm also not using it to refer to a country that gets the most of its gross national product or its gross domestic profit uh, from natural resources, like in the USSR or Suriname or in Norway. So I wanted to be clear before I even start that you know exactly what I'm going to be comparing here. Are there any questions on this so far? No? Okay, then I'll go on. So the first section I'll be talking about is communism and it'll be divided into three sections. I'll be giving some background information, both personal background of Marx and ideological background. Uh, I'll be talking about the main principles of communism as they are uh, derived from philosophy, political science, and economy. And a, a brief look at the history of attempts at communism, I would say. 
Marx's personal efforts, what the revolution in Russia in 1917, and the revolution in China in 1949. Now, you may wonder why I'm going to be giving personal information about Marx. After all, I'm talking about the ideas and not about the people. But I do this because I want this to be clear that these concepts, these ideas, were the products of people. They weren't anything that uh, were like divine messages or anything like that. They were thought of by everyday people. And these people, if we, <clears throat> if we agree that people are the products of their time and their culture, then we have to see that the ideas that they had were also the products of their time and culture. If we look at them in that way, we can look at them much more effectively, in my opinion. Also, by looking at these uh, uh, people uh, uh, as just people, uh, I want to avoid the kind of transference or uh, projection process, which some people tend to have about great leaders. Basically, anybody who says that they can save your life or they can solve all your problems can possibly become the object of your transference. You put them in a sort of godlike position. You think that they're always right. You think that they're in some way, some ways, better than the rest. Um, now, projection is a normal thing. Uh, in the sense that we use it in our associative memory as a part of survival. We identify people, we look at them, we say, do you look like a friend or do you look like a foe? And then we know how to deal with them. But transference is really when we see somebody as higher than uh, normal people and you tend to idealize them. Both Marx and Jacques Frescos were people of their time they came up with their ideas as products of their time and their culture. This may be a, a controversial point for some people. So going on to Marx's background, um, he was born in 1818. So this was shortly after the uh, revolutions of independence, uh, both in North America and in France, which had a very important influence on him in a Jewish middle-class family. So they were part of the bourgeoisie. Bourgeoisie, that's people with property. And uh, they had wine uh, vineyards, so they were people of a comfortable background. Oddly enough, he was able to marry a woman from the aristocracy, but her father had very controversial ideas, and because he supported them, she liked him and they got married. He had university degrees in law and a PhD in philosophy. Philosophy was really a major uh, uh, influence in his whole thinking and ideas. And he was a member of the intelligentsia. So people listened to him. When he published things, they got read. He was also part of the young Hegelians and a rebel his entire life. Now, the ideological influences were most particularly the philosophy of Hegel's dialectics, but also the French philosophers such as Voltaire of uh, the French and American revolutions. As I mentioned, these revolutions were very influential in his thinking process, but also the industrialization of uh, England also played a major role in the ideas, in the concepts that Marx developed. Now, I've briefly mentioned something about philosophy, and I do want to make a few points on this so you understand exactly what, I talk about, what I'm talking about. There are basically three forms of philosophy which you need to know about. You have monism, that's the belief uh, that everything comes from one particular source, mono, that's one. You have dualism, that's the idea that two particular sources work together. Uh, to create things, and then you have pluralism, plural meaning more or many, which says that there are many different influences. Now, we're talking about Marx, and he reacted against the idealism of uh, the 19th century, 
which said that everything is mentally constructed. Everything we know about reality is ba basically just a product of our mind. Marx disagreed with this. He said, no, everything is not a product of the mind. It's a product of the material circumstances that you're in and the interaction between them. Now, a few examples of pluralism which are perhaps interesting are uh, those which appear in epistemology. Epistemology is basically how you know that you know the things you know. <laughs> and uh, basically this branch says for in pluralism that there are more ways, more roads that lead to Rome. It's a kind of pragmatism. So uh, you can say, well, people from different culture have a different look at things. Uh, in logic, you can say, well, many different uh, possible logics uh, could be true. In general, classical logic uh, is correct, but in some circumstances, an alternative logic is correct. Now you can see that this is uh, already being used in uh, science in how physics is defined. They're saying, well, classical laws apply to bigger objects and quantum laws apply to little, littler objects. So that's just a little bit for you guys to know if somebody in your discussion starts throwing uh, philosophical terms at you. Any questions so far? No? Okay, then I'm going to go on to the philosophy that was in the basis of communism. So I mentioned that Marx reacted and was influenced by uh, Hegelian dialectics. Now, dialectics is an old form of logic. It basically means arriving at the truth by solving the differences within it, by resolving internal contradictions. Now, Hegelian dialectic was uh, idealist, and he said there was a contradiction in every concept which first had to be resolved before you would know the truth. Marx made this material, uh, materialistic. He said within any particular system, material, material system, there is an internal contradiction that has to be resolved. It will uh, cause a, a struggle, and when that is finally solved, then the answer will, will be uh, obvious. Now, Marx did not actually uh, use the term uh, historical, uh, I mean dialectical materialism, but he did make historical materialism. Historical materialism was simply analyzing history on the basis of material developments. And most particularly, the, uh, the means of production, material means of production, how things were made, how people worked, and the class relations that were in these systems of production. Engels, did you want to ask something, Tony? No? Okay. Um, <clears throat> Engels, who worked with Marx on the Communist Manifesto, also uh, emphasized that evolution of anything, of concepts, of beings, of societies, always involved the lowest form rising to the higher. So any higher form always would have its roots in the lower. The term dialectical materialism was actually developed by Stalin and further developed by Mao, most particularly in the campaigns of the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution. Then there was the influence of political science. Now, the revolutions in the North America and in France uh, helped Marx to analyze history into six different stages of <clears throat> develop economic development. In each stage, there was a new class or a new invention which would actually bring about the downfall of that society. So this was the internal contradiction, the dialectic within history that Marx identified. He identified, first of all, four stages of uh, economy. 
primitive communism, such as practiced by tribes people. Then you had slave society, for instance, in ancient Egypt and uh, the Sumerian empires and, and the like. Then you had feudalism in which uh, the king and the aristocracy were able to get all the wealth and people had to uh, hire things from them. And finally, capitalism, in which uh, the merchant class was able to get part of the power that the aristocracy had previously had. So in each of these stages, there was always a point when the lower class would rise up and manage to take over power or get more power from the ruling class. But this was not necessarily negative because in this period, more wealth would be accrued and more people would be educated, which would lead to a higher evolution of society. Marx and Engels believed that only in uh, stage five and in stage six, there would be no such uh, negative consequences. Because in socialism, the final oppressive class, so that's the capitalist, would be overthrown by the workers. And society would put, be put in control of the workers. So that's the lowest class rising to power, which, mean that there were no, which means that there are no classes underneath. And because there are no more classes, eventually society would transfer into communism. However, Marx's analysis of history also showed that there had never been any, uh, any uh, uh, change of power without armed uh, or aggressive overthrow. And so he assumed that any further revolutions would have to be armed revolutions. And especially in a socialist society, uh, that um, there would have to be constant revolution going on in order to actually move into communism. The last point I want to mention on the principles of communism are the economic theories that Marx uh, developed, because these were perhaps the most ex extensive. First of all, true to dialectics, he identified that within capitalism, there are definite contradictions that will lead to its overthrow. First of all, you have the question of supply and demand. For capitalism to go on, it has to be able to infinitely supply goods, but there is always a finite market. No matter how fast the population grows, she will not be able to produce things infinitely. So this was one of the contradictions. The growth also in producers, so not just one person is going to make a product, but there will be competition in the market of many different producers. So that means more goods are going to be produced and the costs are going to be lowered. That means there's going to be, have to be more production, but nobody needs it anymore. So they have to look for new markets. But even these new markets, the globe and uh, the earth is a limited <laughs> land uh, area. So the markets are going to be limited also. So at some point, uh, okay, uh, at some point, uh, the uh, competent, the, the capitalism is going to collapse. Uh, or at least the system as, a, as we know it will collapse and the people producing things are going to become increasingly aggressive looking to get cheaper labor or more markets and if this takes place on a national level you're going to be having wars and world wars. This is something that Marx analyzed and uh, talked about already 150 years ago. <clears throat> The second important internal contradiction uh, within capitalism that Marx identified was the emergence of the working class. Remember, in feudalist society, you didn't have a working class, you had the aristocracy and you had the peasants, which was not exactly the same. 
It was being a peasant was only slightly better than being a slave. But in capitalism, the worker had a certain amount of freedom to go to whichever employer was willing to pay the most or whoever had the best conditions. So this gave more freedom to the worker. But this in itself would also lead to the downfall of capitalism. Marx thought that work was a way for people to actualize themselves. But he analyzed that as labor became more and more uh, removed from uh, the actual product, for instance, uh, you make one part of a car and the person down the line, he makes another part of the car, but you only make one small part. So you don't have any pride in your work because you don't have any real relationship with the product. So this is what Marx said led to a kind of alienation for the workers. They were po that was possible for them to see what uh, the difference between what they were able to do but, and what they were actually doing, and they became dissatisfied. <clears throat> The industrialization in England in the 19th century really served to in, uh, accelerate this process. On the one hand, it was good for capitalism because they could make more products more cheaply, but it also meant that workers became even more alienated or distanced from the actual work they were doing. They felt just like a machine. So Marx believed that this would become so awful for workers that at a certain point they would just have to rise up and take over the factories and go to the form of socialism. <clears throat> now it's important that you also know what Marx meant about, social, uh, about the term socialism because it's not what is in some countries what they call is socialism. For Marx, socialism was a definite stage in economic development. And the only reason that things would be made were if people needed them. So the motivating force for production was its use value. That meant the law of value or profit under capitalism would no longer be there. The production for, of use would be coordinated, coordinated through a conscious economic planning, and the distribution would go on the basis of contribution. So the more you gave, the more you were able to work, the more you would be able to, rece be able to receive. Now the relationships under socialism would be a lot different than under capitalism. In capitalism, you have a boss that can tell you everything and takes away your profit while you get some kind of salary. In socialism, you're actually working with your own things. So any kind of benefit, any kind of surplus would go directly either to you or to the society as a whole. Um, so this is much different than uh, socialism, which still retains a market, which is just another kind of uh, friendly capital capitalism, let's say or based on some kind of mutualism or sharing or utopian schemes. For Marx, this was a definite stage moving on to communism. <clears throat> so how did Marx actually see communism? Well, it's characterized by common ownership of the means of production. Everybody, everything that is used to produce things, which uh, gives any goods, is the property of everybody. There is free access to all articles of consumption. And there are no classes and no government. Communism is a specific stage in socio-economic development because it's based on the superabundance of material wealth. This might sound familiar. And this wealth is, uh, we get this superabundance, yes, through the advances in the production of technology, and the differences in the social relations that these advances bring about. So communism was actually intended to eliminate divisions between public and private life, 
between civil society, so everyday society, and the state. Between, uh, it would eliminate all political institutions, all authority, all government. There would be no private property, and there would be no class ex exploitation, because there would be no classes. So those are basically the principles of capitalism, which are <laughs> actually the true ones. Are there any questions any of you have on anything I've mentioned so far? Yeah? Um, I just wanted to know if you could clarify what you mean between uh, public and private life. Yeah, public and, yeah, that's an interesting thing you mentioned. Um, I'll give an example from my own personal experience when I lived in China in 1983. Um, <laughs> this was the first, first place I had lived outside of the United States. And the house that I lived in was on the opposite side of an elementary school. And throughout the university compounds, there were loudspeakers all over. At six o'clock in the morning, I was awakened with exercise music. The first morning, I looked outside and I saw everybody was on the playground at the elementary school on the other side of the street, and they were all doing exercises together. Um, and another thing was when uh, it was weekend, I thought, well, Saturday and Sunday, I don't give lessons, so that's my time off. But people would come to my house, just knock on the door and come over for a visit, because there was no difference between working life and private life. Now, this was just after Mao had died, so society was much more, uh, in 1983, it was much more like how the Communist Party at that time had been running it than before. Um, Marx had the idea that uh, public life, where you have to do things secretly or that nobody knows about, would not actually be necessary in a communist state because everything would be every there would be no secrets everybody would be working together for a better future does that answer your question nicholas huh? does that answer your question nicholas yeah okay i think my um my videos um got a bit of delay but yes it does thank you okay good any other uh, any other questions on what I've mentioned so far? Okay, then um, <clears throat> I want to go on to the history of communism. By the way, um, Erica and others that have joined me uh, later, uh, I you can always watch the rest uh, the beginning of the presentation on the film that we post. And I've also put the PowerPoint on Facebook if you've missed some parts. So the next thing I want to talk about in terms of uh, the history of communism is how actually Marx and Engels' principles were put into practice. Now, I'll begin with what Marx did in his lifetime himself. Um, there was, of course, before 1948, there were various underground communist movements going on. After all, we are again talking about a time after the North American revolutions, the French revolutions, and revolutionary uh, feeling was still very strong. So there was also a very strong idealist uh, philosophical movements. They wanted to have the perfect society. So there were a lot of communist uh, movements already in secret going on. But in 1848, Marx and Engels wrote up the Communist Manifesto as a statement of their intentions for the Communist League of Brussels. They told the Communist League, if you continue to operate in secret, nobody will know about you, you won't get the kind of support that you need, and you will never be able to stage revolution. So they became a public political party, and the Communist Manifesto was their declaration of what they stood for and what they wanted to do. Now, at the time, uh, there was a big upsurge of uh, revolutionary uh, activity in France and Germany, and Marx 
moved from Brussels to Paris and brought the Communist League with him. In 1850, he had to leave uh, Paris because of uh, suppression of the revolutionary movements. And he brought, of course, the Communist League with him. But there he had to really struggle uh, with a left-wing uh, element in the group that wanted to stage a communist revolution in England immediately. Marx and Engels said, the situation for the working class is not right. If we do that now, we'll be destroyed, they'll shut us down, and uh, it will be the end of any chance for a communist revolution. Fortunately, most people listened to, him, to them, and they did not do anything about that. After that, the first International Working Men's Association was formed uh, in New York, and here Marx had to struggle against the left-wing anarchist movement. But again, Marxism uh, was uh, adopted as the principal uh, doctrine, but the center of the movement went to New York in 1871. This was at the same time of the Paris Commune. For those of you that don't know, the Paris Commune was a time in Paris when all power, the whole of society, was taken over and run on a primitive communist sort of uh, way for six months. So these were really dynamic times going on. At the end of his life, Marx heard about the um, movements uh, occurring in Russia. And he, con he considered the idea that, well, perhaps Russia would be able to go on to communism without first having capitalism if they worked on the kind of mere or commune type of villages that Russia had at the time. So he did have this, he did uh, say that it might be possible. And this gave the Russians enough encouragement to go on further on their own. Now, the Russian Revolution is perhaps one of the most well known revolutions that took part in, that has taken part in the world. And before I go on to discussing this revolution and China, I do want to make one point clear. Any communist, so called communist revolution that has taken place in the world has always taken place in a country that is not actually capitalist. It is still in a feudal level of development, which means that they still have peasantry, they don't have much industrialization. Now, in Russia, in, uh, at the turn of the 20th century, it was still being ruled by Tsar Nicholas II. And although it was slowly being industrialized, any movement towards a uh, union organization or any kind of left-wing socialism or anything was immediately crushed. But the people were so dissatisfied with it that they were able to stage a small revolution in 1905. And this brought about a, uh, the forming of a parliament. So it became more of a kind of parliamentary uh, monarchy, as you see in Europe. Now, the big problem for Nic Nicholas II was when he got Russia involved in World War I. Not only did they, end, uh, did they not have enough industrial power to produce all the machinery and the weapons that they needed, but the biggest problem for the people was the immense shortage, the incredible shortage of food going on. The problem was not that they were unable to grow food. The harvests were not changed from before the war. The big problem was in the economic measures that Nicholas had taken to finance the war. They had printed millions of ruble notes to pay for the war. This led to a devaluation of the currency and a rising of prices. So by 1917, prices for food were four times higher than they had been in 1914. But these higher prices did not mean <laughs> that the uh, peasants got more money. No, they had to pay more money for the things that they needed for their farming, but they didn't get any of the profits. That was all taken by the middlemen. So 
instead of starving and instead of losing money, the pe peasantry decided, well, then we'll just keep our food for ourselves. So they stopped making food for sales. They just made food for themselves and their families. This meant that the cities were constantly short of food. The prices ra ra rose. And in the factories, you have strikes for wages, strikes for more political representation, strikes against the war, and the perfect situation for a revolution. So indeed, in February 1917, Nicholas II was uh, <clears throat> put out of power by the socialists, or the Mensheviks. But the Mensheviks made one major mistake in terms of holding on to power, and that was that they kept Russia in World War II. The population, on the other hand, the peasantry were the ones that were sending their sons to war. They were the ones that were getting killed. The Bolsheviks used an anti-war uh, platform uh, against the Mensheviks. They infiltrated the unions or the Soviets, and they uh, propaganda, uh, circulated propaganda there. Plus, the German, German government was secretly supporting the Bolsheviks because they wanted Russia out of the war. So with all these factors, the Bolsheviks, the Communist Party of Russia, were able to take power in October of 1917. Now, most people see Vladimir Lenin as the father of the revolution. He was indeed the person that got the most of his writing published. But at the time of the revolution, he was actually in exile. Leon Trotsky, uh, who was in Russia, was also the key figure which cemented the bond with the army, the Red Army. Joseph Stalin was, of course, uh, a general in the army, and that fortified the position. Now, Lenin, uh, in the, uh, at first, supported Joseph Stalin. At the, end, at the end of Lenin's life, when he became sick, he supported Joseph Stalin. But when it became clear that Stalin intended to increase uh, government, bureaucracy, and uh, other ideas that he had, Lenin changed his idea and uh, wanted Trotsky to be his supporter. He wrote several documents to that effect, but Stalin suppressed those documents, wiped out any mention of Trotsky in any of Lenin's writing. So when Lenin passed away, there was a big power struggle. And this is one of the things you're going to see in all of the revolutions that at a certain point there is some kind of struggle for power about whose in interpretation is going to be the correct one. Some people said, well, first we have to build up Russia so that it's a capitalist economy, that we have enough industry, that we have enough wealth so that we can go on to a socialist and a communist society. But other people said that we should try and build up socialism and communism in one country. When it became clear that the rest of the world was not going to join Russia in a revolution, Stalin decided on the policy of socialism in one country, and he used the governmental bureaucracy for this purpose. Now, a national communist actually, communism actually goes completely against uh, the Marxist position that revolution would have to be worldwide. You could not have one single country which is socialist or communist. It would have to be a worldwide thing. However, Stalin was able to seize power. He sent Trotsky into exile, and many say that he killed Trotsky abroad. Now, the internal problems uh, of communism was not the only thing they had to deal with. The communist or the, the socialist party in uh, Russia had to deal with incredible resistance from the allied forces. As soon as uh, the communist party came into power in 1917, Germany and all the other powers, France, England, the United States, 
all the other uh, allies started working directly against so uh, the Russian par uh, National Party, uh, sorry, Communist Party. This led to a lot of uh, unrest within the country, a lot of attempts for a coup d'etat to take over power again by capitalists or uh, the white Russian government until 1923. At that point, Soviet power was established. But even so, as you probably know, from that moment on, Western powers have done everything they possibly could to undermine the Russian government in terms of economic boycotts, uh, warfare, uh, propaganda, all different things. And of course, at this, Russia also tried to make the idea of global communism come true. And they took over countries like Poland, Hungary, uh, East Germany, uh, in order to form a kind of bloc. So this made them also more capable of uh, any kind of armed uh, intervention that the, the West might undertake. Um, but the problem is, um, When people point to Russia as an example of communism, there are some absolute, absolute uh, errors to this opinion. First of all, the state ownership of production, distribution, and the profits coming from this production all went to the state, which means that government officials were able to get more money, more luxuries, more uh, uh, benefits than workers and peasants. So this led again to a new type of class stratification. And this is exactly what communism was supposed to wipe out. The second, uh, <clears throat> of course, was that it continued to work with a market economy. So producing cheaply and uh, se selling at a pro profit. So that meant that the law of value was still the determining factor in production. As I mentioned earlier, in a Marxist socialist society, the determining of production is what people need to use, not profit. So these two factors should make clear to anybody who knows anything about Marxism that the USSR is not a communist country. What they have there is not communism, it's not socialism, it's state capitalism. Any questions on this? No? If you have questions, just turn on your mics because I don't see everybody. Okay, then I'm gonna go on to the history of communism in China. Now, China was a similar situation. It was a, a country still in a feudal type of economic uh, development. And you had Puyi, who was the last emperor, who was in power during the division of China between the imperial, imperialist part, uh, powers in the, early, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The Japanese, the Americans, the English, the French, and the Germans, they all owned a part of China. Of course, the Chinese did not like this. And so a nationalist party was made and their platform was nationalism, democracy, and land to the people. Through popular support, the nationalist party was able to depose Puyi in 1912. Maybe you've seen the film, The Last Emperor, that, uh, that shows how the uh, Hu Yi was taken from his throne in 1912, and the Nationalist Party took power. It was originally under the control of Sun Yat-sen, but the general Yuan Shikai became uh, the leader, and he wanted to actually become royalty himself. So you see that uh, even revolutionaries, once they get power, <laughs> they want to get even more power. This uh, disrupted the, the 
national government and individual areas of uh, the rulers of individual areas of China all fought against each other to get more power, which is what we call warlordism. But then World War II broke out and China had to get together to fight off imperial powers once again. There was a strategic alliance between the Kuomintang, or Nationalist Party, which was headed by Chiang Kai-shek, and the Zhongguo Gongchandong, which is the Communist Party of China, which was formed in 1921 and headed by Mao Zedong, who was also an army general. They were able to defeat the, imperial, uh, the imperialist powers, and the Republic of China uh, was established from 1925 through 1948, but because uh, the Nationalist Party wanted to compromise with Japan when it invaded the country again in 1937, the Communist power Party was able to take over power. The Communist Party said no imperialist party uh, powers in China. And they were able to get more power than the nationalists. Uh, and they fought against Japanese occupation. And in 1949, established the People's Republic of China. The Nationalist Party only got to rule in Taiwan. Now, the history of the Chinese People's uh, Communist Pe Party of China is one of ceaseless class warfare. So this was one of the things that Marx said would have to take part in socialism. Revolutionaries would always have to be aware of anything that could undermine the progress to communism, any attempts to go back to capitalism or class society, and weed it out. Mao was really uh, uh, very determined about this. And they fought off the insurgencies from within and from out, and they also expanded uh, their uh, revolution to areas like Vietnam and Korea. Uh, the Cultural Revolution, which was headed by the Gang of Four, was the last program that Mao used to try and continue communist revolutionary activities. Actually, the Cultural Revolution was designed to get rid of old forms of culture which were based on class society. So almost all the plays, all the books you read in China, they're all about the wonderful feudal history of the emperors and things like that. And Mao said, if we want to have a new society, we have to have a new kind of culture. And so they tried to establish a new kind of workers' culture. But this went, went <laughs> really badly because the peasants, they, they were not educated enough to understand how to go about this in a good way. So a lot of people got killed. A lot of intelligent members of an intelligentsia were killed. But basically, Mao was trying to uh, avoid Deng Xiaoping and his supporters taking over the party. But when Mao died, Deng Xiaoping did take over the Communist Party, and he led the country through far-reaching market economy reforms. Now, this is what I saw when I went to China. When I went to China, they had first they had just opened up the new free cities. In the free cities, the people were allowed to operate capitalism. People were able to go there and sell their things for profits, just like they were in a capitalist society. And this was just the beginning. This is spread now pretty much throughout the whole of China. It's led to a lot of development in a lot of ways, but it has strengthened, strengthened the market economy again, so the law of value, profit, is still the motivating force for the economy and it has led to social stratification. People with more profit get a higher class. People in the government get more uh, rights, get more luxuries, things like that. So once again, the economic system in China is not communism, 
It's state capitalism. Any questions on this? Okay. Then I'd like to move on to the lessons that we can learn from this history and from this theory. First of all, let's look at what factors allowed these communist powers to actually stage semi-successful revolutions. We cannot avoid the circumstance of mentioning the circumstances of social upheaval brought about by the two world wars. People get uh, unhappy when their children are sent off to die, when they don't have enough uh, goods of their own. And these things make, made the conditions ripe for parties that say, we have a better way that doesn't involve war. Another factor that was important were that the Bolsheviks and the Communist Party targeted specific classes with the recruitment to the party and their propaganda. They said, well, people aren't in the, the bourgeoisie and the aristocracy. These are not people that are going to so support us. We have to go to the workers and to the peasants. These are people and some parts of the intelligentsia these are people who will be open to our ideas. Of course, if you have to have armed revolution, controlling the army is very important. So a key element to the success of both the Russians and Chinese were that they had control of the army. The fact that they used the existing government structures was also a benefit because they were able to organize production and distribution and uh, social, keep social order relatively quickly. And finally, there was a detailed analysis and plan for the society of transition to communism. What can we learn about the things that didn't work? Well, first of all, as I mentioned, these countries had insufficient technological uh, in, or economic basis where the evolu a revolution took place. Marx designed communism and socialism for a fully developed, industrialized, capitalist country. And these countries did not fit that uh, criteria, so it made it much harder for them if they were going to succeed. The revolutions were also not worldwide. They were isolated. That meant that they could be attacked from inside and outside through sabotage, counterinsurgency, uh, uh, financial uh, embargoes. Another important point were the disagreements on the interpretation of Marxism. This led to different parties and power struggles within the Communist Party. Another factor that I think people have to also keep in mind, I'm just going to turn on the light here, is uh, that there was an idealization of specific leaders. Now, I believe that they had a reason for this that I'll talk about uh, later, um, why they idealized people like Marx or Lenin or Mao or Stalin. I mean, in Russia, in China, you can still see statues of them. Uh, in the Cultural Revolution, everybody was carrying a little red book which were the quotations by Mao. So these figures were being glorified. And this was a problem because when these people died, it meant that the people didn't know where to look. And there was no easy transition to the next uh, uh, government. And finally, the internal contradictions which are related to human consciousness, to behavior and to cultural values, were not really addressed well by Marxism and in Russia. And although Mao made an attempt, it was still in a very primitive way, if you compare to what we know now about behavior and human development. So these are some of the factors that I think can serve as lessons for people who want to work for a better future and a different kind of government. 
I'd now like to go over to a brief discussion of the resource-based economy. Now, this I won't spend so much time on since it's probably well known to all of you, but I'm going to be covering the points that I also uh, covered with communism. So first of all, the personal background of Schuck. He was born in 1916, also to a Jewish family of immigrants from the Middle East. 1916 is also a, 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 an important date because just like Ma, uh, Marx was born just after the French Revolution, Fr Jacques Fresco was born be, uh, at the time of the World Wars and the Great Depression. So these social events must have had a very powerful influence on the way he was developed, how he developed his concepts. Now he's a wild boy of the road, which a wild boy of the road, you've maybe, maybe seen this before. This is the name of a film uh, of the 1960s, I think, about uh, young guys who drop out of high school and they go on the road and they travel and they work and that sort of thing. He educated himself, so uh, as far as I know, he did not attend school after high school. Uh, he did have a short stay in the military in which he practiced uh, technical design, but it didn't really agree with him and he left rather quickly. Uh, he was a designer at uh, various corporations such as Philips and he came up with revolutionary des designs also at the World Fair. He would have uh, exhibitions there, but most people considered his plans impractical and he didn't really get a lot of support. He also had a brief practice in psychology. Now, as I mentioned, the revolutions, I mean, the, the world wars and the communist movement going on at the time when he was born probably had a very important influence on how he saw economics. But more importantly, the developments in science and technology played a major role in how he envisioned a better society. Moreover, he incorporated uh, the latest developments in um, hu uh, human development at that time, namely uh, evolution uh, by Darwin and the behaviorism by B.F. Skinner. On the TVP side, you can see several books on these subjects which, he rec which are recommended. So, as I mentioned, and you probably already know, one of the most formative experiences for Jacques was in the Depression when he saw all of the factories were closed and people had no money and people didn't have things. And he realized for himself there was nothing wrong with the factories, they just didn't have them, they weren't giving money to the factories to produce things. But the factories could still produce things even if there wasn't money. So that's probably one of the most essential points of a resource-based economy is the removal of money and, an, and uh, uh, the law of value and an economy based on the abundance through a strategic use of technology. And as I also mentioned, essential to these strategies are sustainability of the planet, the environment, and a holistic approach to the application of technology. I've listed a link here that I hope you all get a chance to watch uh, after the presentation. It's a really good film of about 13 minutes in which somebody describes a resource-based uh, economy in terms of strategies. So you see, it's all just a really strategic look at how to produce things, how to implement things, Really a nice thing to use in your talks with people. Now, uh, Jacques' look at economics was uh, not so extensive because he just eliminated money and uh, it was based on uh, the value of need. So what people needed, that would be produced. But when, Jacques, uh, when people became aware of Jacques' uh, concepts in the 1970s uh, and 80s, um, several economists attacked the resource-based economy with the same arguments that the Austrian economists von Mises had, had used 
about a moneyless socialist or communist society. And I found this really excellent analysis of why von Mises' economic arguments do not work uh, at the site I have you listed. Again, I recommend reading it. She has also a lot of other stuff, which is quite well written and uh, researched about a resource-based economy. But I'll talk about two of the main arguments against von Mises here, and which you might be able to use in your talks with people about an RBE. First of all, von Mises said, we have to use money because that determines the most efficient use of a resource. So if something is very rare, if there's not very much of it, that means the price will be high, which means people won't use it so much. So the, the level of the price determines how something is used. He said, if you don't have money, there will be no good way to determine how to use resources effectively. But a resource-based economy works differently. Money is a very limited indicator. It only shows supply and demand. The hidden costs, like cost to the environment, costs to the workers, costs to society. None of them are included in money as a medium for value. And actually, the only one who really cares how much a resource costs is the one who's hoping to make a profit. So <laughs> people just want to buy the product. They don't care how much it costs the person to, to make it. So money is not at all the best way of determining the use of resources. The second argument that economists bring in about a resource-based economy is that even if you were able to take all the various factors like uh, cost to the worker, cost to environment, cost to society, cost, even if you did all of that, no human mind could judge which of them was more important, less important, and be able to analyze them effectively. So because that would be impossible for the human mind to do, we would have to use money because that was the only thing that we would have. Now, there are two very good arguments against this. To begin with, a resource-based economy takes the human mind completely out of the equation in how resources are uh, used. We automate these processes. Computers make the decision based on the information, up to the minute information, that they are given. Moreover, they can also be programmed with a uh, ordinal scale. That means saying, well, this is the most important, this is the second most important, third most important, etc. So the computer weighs all of these different factors for each specific product in each specific moment for the best use of resources. Another point about, against this argument is that in a resource-based economy, you don't have some kind of universal rule like capitalism does. You have to always maximize profit and minimize costs. By using the scientific method, each situation is judged individually based on specific circumstances. So if you ever get into a discussion about the economy of a resource-based economy uh, and they come up with these stupid arguments, you're now prepared <laughs> to argue against those effectively. Uh, the final area uh, that is uh, major principles that make major principles of the resource-based economy have to do with science and technology. Now, everything I've described so far should have made clear that uh, the scientific method and technolo technological development are essential for a strategic redesign of society. But you're going to get a lot of people worried about the increase of technology. So it's important when they express this worry 
that you emphasize that the uses in a resource-based economy are much different than the uses in capitalist society. In a capitalist society, technology is always used depending on money. So they're used to make the most money for capitalists, no matter what it does to the rest of the people or the planet. In a resource-based economy, technology is not going to depend, uh, the development is not going to depend on uh, making a profit, uh, making a business better, or something like this. It's going to be for the good of all people and the planet. Another point is that removing capitalism, the, the, the interests in technology, behind technology and, and scientific development, there's going to be a lot more freedom in these fields. Scientific investigation is going to be possible for any kind of phenomenon, and not just the phenomenon that people think are going to make money for them. Another important point that uh, you need to mention uh, in discussions about the resource-based economy is that Fresco emphasizes that an RBE is a holistic system. Now, some people have questions about what does Fresco mean by holistic? And on the TVP Global, uh, TVP International Support page, uh, somebody wrote a really good reaction to this, which I have summarized here. Basically, uh, Fresco is using the term holistic in the way they do in engineering. In engineering, you have various models for solving a, pro a problem when you want to design something. You have the top-down process, and you have the bottom-up process. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail about what these actually are, not being an engineer, but I recommend, if you're curious about this, to look on the TVP International Support page for this discussion on what he means about a holistic system. And the final area that Jacques uh, <clears throat> developed for a resource-based economy is a more detailed look at how human development and relations are going to figure in this new society. Now, as a basis, Fresco takes that human behavior is conditioned and formed by the material environment and social relations. And his look at human relations was based on Darwinism, on evolution, and uh, the form of psychology called behaviorism, which was popular in the 1950s to the 1980s. Evolutionary theories say that every kind of behavior is only retained, people only do the things that support their survival. Those are the uh, behaviors that they hold on to. Behaviorism also only looks at how uh, the material reactions of people to certain stimuli. So if you are rewarded for something or if you are punished for doing something, how that influences behavior. So these were the two forces, I believe, which formed his view on human relations and development. Finally, a brief look at the history of uh, the resource-based economy. Um, now, there have been to date no uh, revolutions for an RBE, unfortunately, but we can keep hoping. But there, have been, there has been uh, different stages of development. As I mentioned, Fresco was already busy with his futuristic designs uh, with technocracy uh, incorporated in the 1940s and 1950s. And these designs were directed at reducing the housing problems that were uh, evident there during the Second World War and thereafter. However, many of his futuristic designs were not supported by colleagues, and there was a, um, he was known as a frustrated genius. By the way, this information I've taken from uh, the venusproject.com page. There's a lot of um, newspaper articles 
from now from 2017 to 1940 all about Jacques Fresco. So if you're interested in how his work developed, you can look at these different uh, newspaper stories. In 1961, he developed his first real social project, and that was Project Americana in 1961. And he wrote his first book with uh, Ken Keyes in 1969 called Looking Forward. He, in 1970s, he first developed uh, the schooling program, education program, socio-cyber engineering, which the Venus Project is still offering now. And he wrote a book about it in 1977. In the 1980s, uh, he and Roxanne Men Meadows established the Venus Pro Project in Venus, Florida. So this is an area of land where they have built many of the futuristic designs that they saw as being in the system in the future. And uh, wrote the book, or was the film, The Venus Project, The Redesign of Culture. But the real breakthrough in terms of uh, becoming well known was when uh, the Venus Project and Jacques Fresco were included in the second Zeitgeist film, Addendum. In this way, the Venus Project and Fresco got international attention. And for some years, there was a collaboration with Peter Joseph and the Zeitgeist Movement. At that time, the film, uh, Jacques also wrote uh, the book, The Best That Money Can't Buy, in 2002. And this was how he introduced his ideas to Peter Joseph uh, and why Peter wanted to include him in the film. However, in 2012, there was a disagreement about how um, the education was going on, and there was a split between the two groups. Uh, nevertheless, the resource-based economy as a concept has been taken up by a number of uh, various groups. Uh, now, the Venus Project is basically against smaller groups. It believes the, it will be more effective if everybody works together under the Venus Project control. The smaller groups, on the other hand, are addressing subjects which the Venus Project is not. For instance, how to form a transition society, what sort of cities will be necessary, uh, looking at taking over political offices as a way of introducing the resource-based economy. And in this regard, you can mention the groups Ubuntu and the Money Free Party. And there are also other groups which include consciousness-related elements. So that's the situation that the resource-based economy is in at the present. Are there any questions on what I've said about the resource-based economy? No? Okay. Is the and, only reason yeah? that him and Peter, well, that this and the Zeitgeist movement didn't go the same way for education? Um, well, as I understand it, um, the, the, uh, the official line by Jacques and Roxanne is that the Zeitgeist movement was not uh, teaching the resource-based economy correctly. So that's the official line. That works. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I'm keeping it at for this moment. <laughs> yeah? There are other people say other things, but we're not concentrating on that now, so I'll just give that one answer. We can always look into it at another time. Anything else? Okay, so I don't know if you can all read this very well. I have to put on my glasses <laughs> for it. But I've made this chart of a comparison of the things that I've mentioned in this presentation so far. Um, now, one thing I want to make uh, clear is that in this column, I have both ideas that refer to socialism and communism. Now, I'm sh I hope you're all clear on the fact that socialism and communism are two different uh, social systems, 
and that so socialism was always seen as something that would lead to communism. The resource-based economy does not include a transition society. So in that sense, the, com the comparison is not exact, but I did this if you want to have some facts at your disposal when you talk to people that you can use these points. So you can see that uh, there, the, the economic fast factor is uh, actually the thing which is the most uh, the same. Uh, both of them are based on a moneyless society. Communism is moneyless and on an abundance from technology. Production is based on need. The resource-based economy that goes one step further, in my opinion, it's not only what people need, but also what the planet can bear. So this is that holistic element which Marx and Engels did not include in their theories. The distribution of products would be to each according to his need, Whereas in a resource-based economy, everything would be available to everything. People can just order what they need or what they want. It doesn't even have to be needed. Uh, labor is from each according to his ability. Now, labor is another major difference between communism and an RBE. Marx could not imagine uh, how technology would, would uh, develop as it has. So he thought that people would always be working and this was really going to be the height of their self-actualization. We know now that actually the way automation is going, most people will hardly have to work at all and that they're going to be looking for other ways to actualize themselves, to reach their full potential. So this is another fundamental difference between these two theories. And in that sense, uh, this freedom to uh, develop yourself to your full potential, this is also something which goes against the communist idea of no division between public and private and uh, civil and uh, social life. There's much more room for individual development in an RBE than Marx could ever imagine. Um, ownership also looks relatively the same, although in socialism you have uh, state ownership of everything. Eventually that would move over to universal ownership of everybody, by everybody, as, uh, but RBE again goes one step holistically further. It's not only the means of production, but it's also the resources that the planet has. So there's much more an emphasis in an RBE of preserving our planet. Uh, the technology that Marx envisioned was again quite primitive. They had just developed uh, the production line, whereas now we're talking about everything being automated from doctors to, to, to technicians to everything and artificial intelligence. Now, in the communist society, decisions would be made on a democratic basis, and at least during socialism, through a state run by the people. In the RBE, uh, decisions will be uh, done by automation. So all the information will be kept up to the minute, and the programs will be directed to maximizing the well-being of all people and all uh, resources. The, philo oops, sorry. <laughs> the philosophical background is also interesting. Um, now, uh, Marx had historical materialism and dialectics, whereas the resource-based economy will have the scientific method and materialism. Now, I've got a question mark here because owing to the discussions of holism and the way science is going, I don't know if a monastic philosophy, so the belief that there is only one formative power in the universe uh, or, or element, I don't know if that's going to hold up. Uh, the paradigm, again, from Marx, that was monastic materialism. 
I've said for the resource-based economy, we'll call that holistic materialism for the time being. And finally, the human behavior was very much uh, determined by human production relations and material basis, whereas the resource-based economy takes a much more uh, advanced psychological look at how human behavior is formed, uh, not only through evolutionary uh, development, but also through the study of psychology. Questions or comments here? Yeah, Simon. I have some comments. They are mostly positive. I mean, this is one of the best presentations, not to just, uh, just the truth. Uh, everything I know is, uh, I think it's not, always agree is not a good thing, but this time I, I heard from different resources from um, Professor Richard Wolf, which is a professor of, uh, he studied history of this capitalism and socialism, Marxism, and I listened to him, and this is what he says as well. This is uh, very parallel. The, the information is right. As far as I know, I'm an, not an expert, but I listened to him, so it is all right. And this is very enlightening. And uh, what I can comment about these things that I can remember so far, one thing that uh, when you discuss with, if, if someone tells you capitalism, you know, the free market is good and it's efficient or whatever, you can, apart from what you said, you can tell about the competition. For example, um, it is um, capitalism, the free market is short term profits. So if you have a forest, if you have wood, and you are a table producer, you have to produce tables, right? You have to look, you are, because you're in competition, you can't think uh, future, what will be, you can't think in sustainable terms, you have to make profits in 10 years to overcome the other companies. So you suck out the resources, so you don't, you can't think, you can't plan for the future. You suck up the resources, you consume the forest, and then you invest, invest your money, not in table production, but in fridge production, in not, not in table, but you produce something else because you have imaginary money, but you cut all the forests. So this is the thing. If someone tells you that we have resources, the, then the money goes up, the wood prices goes up, so you will not consume all the forest. It is not true because you can consume all the forest, then you have the money put in the bank, you can put your money in other things, not in the table production, yeah, exactly. in other businesses. You see, this, this is the point. You can shift it to other things and you can consume all the resources like this with playing this game. It is not about resource efficiency. It's about money. It's just made up imaginary things. So you can... Exactly. And also because, because people have to have money uh, in order to survive, of course they want to make money. They're not worried about the forest. They're worried about getting money to feed their children. They will play this game because this system is facing people with the environment, with the nature. We are enemies. We are not working together. We are not planned. Nothing is planned. We, this system is making us enemies. Yeah. You consume the forest. You are, you, you are making tables. You better consume the forest. Cut, all, cut them all if you want to survive or else you will diminish, right? So yeah. this system is forcing that there is no, as Jack Fresco said, there is no good people or bad people. This system is forcing, like ignorance. With ignorance, they are, we are, they are forcing people to be selfish, to consume, to cut all the forest, you know, to exploit people, go to China, make them slaves, child, child, child workers. All is a product of the system, nothing else. Yeah, if someone exactly. tells you it's efficient, tell this, that this, this, um, this, the, 
this mechanism that is working. Yeah. If you're a table producer, you have to compete in 10 years, you must make more profits. You have, you cut all the forest, go to other business. Yeah. Or, you go to, or you go to another country, you take over another you country. Another, you have the money. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, all about money. That's, that's yeah. the thing. So thank you very much. That's, that's yeah. the thing. No, thank you. Yeah, the competition element of capitalism, again, that's one of the... Uh, selfishness. Yeah. Greed. Yeah. And that that's makes people thing. selfish. Yeah. And it makes, uh, I think this is, this was the thing, as I know about this difference between, they say, what is socialism, what is communism? They, they said the, the power, Jack Fresco wanted to prevent the concentration of power with... Yeah scientific decisions, this is the, his main thing, that the yeah. science is the... Pro so, in communism, with Lenin, when they, when they come up, you know, in the beginning of the 18th, what, 90s, at the beginning of 90s, they said, as I know right from the Richard, Professor Richard Wolff, he said that the Lenin wanted to make socialism, which is uh, there will be no power that is governing people. Everyone will govern themselves. Yeah. And then Stalin came yeah. before it is established and it became fascism. So yeah. everyone knows communism and the fascism of the government, the power of the government, but it is state capitalism, as you said. Yeah, I'm going to talk about a few of those things also later when, uh, when I talk about different considerations we can have. But thanks for your comments on that. Okay, thank you very much. Now, I've got uh, some quotations here from the Venus Project site uh, from the various uh, frequently asked questions. And I find these answers a little bit confusing because when you read them, uh, <clears throat> you see that uh, Jacques was referring to communism in its uh, form uh, either as socialism or as the governments of Russia and China. Now, I think you've seen through this presentation that, that that's not really the case. And uh, as Semi says, other professionals, uh, professors, uh, Marxist scholars, they will also tell you that's not communism. So I'm a little bit surprised that the answers on the frequently asked questions on the Venus Project site use that definition. I don't know if it's intentional, so if they did it on purpose or not. It seems amazing to me that they would not know what communism actually is. So I'm just going to have to assume that uh, Jacques talked about communism in the way that most people understood it. But if you talk to people that really know what communism is, in my opinion, you're not really going to make much of an impression with these answers because they're going to be pinning you down like uh, on the Facebook uh, uh, conversation that Stephanie was having this week. Uh, there was somebody who came uh, with definitions of socialism and communism. And they were exactly the same as some of the points for, the, for an RBE. So if you get somebody that really knows what communism is and socialism is, these aren't going to be enough. So I, I, I will use the ones of these that you think are useful, but I think some of these are not going to help you out if you get into a deeper discussion of it. So. Finally, I want to move on to the last part and basically the things that I think might be major discussion points uh, with people uh, about the difference between these two systems. Now, one of the things that uh, Andrew mentioned on the discussion on Stephanie's page, which I thought was very, uh, very good, was you have to identify uh, when people are using faulty logic. So they say, well, communism didn't work, so why should an RBE? In other words, they're saying, uh, well, communism didn't want money, and an RBE doesn't want money. That means they're the same, 
so they won't work. And uh, Andrew said, well, this is a prima facie uh, fault of logic. That means you are basing your argument on too little evidence. You don't have enough proof. You're only looking at one part of the systems, not all of them. So if they come at you with something like that, it may be useful to ask them what they know about communism, and then you can come with different points uh, from a resource-based economy which are similar or different and show how they have developed. Another point that we made in the last meeting about nonviolent conversation is that sometimes you're not going to engage. So when you're talking to people who are really not open to listening, they have a particular line and they only want to argue, it's really not worth the effort to try and convince them with facts. They're not going to listen. You have to really look at their sort of background, just like the Marxists did when they looked at different classes. Who are the people that are most likely going to be open to these arguments? Those are the people you're gonna want to invest more time in than people who are not willing to listen to anything. Now, as Semi mentioned, this dictatorship uh, point is going to be a problem because one of the questions a lot of people are always asking about an RBE, well, who's going to make the decisions? Isn't there gonna be some kind of select group? The communists would have dictatorship of the proletariat. What is an RBE going to do? And they're also going to be looking at, some people project this onto artificial intelligence. So they say, oh, AI is going to develop consciousness and take over the planet or something. So this is a point that I think uh, you have to be clear how an RBE is going to avoid this kind of things. That the programming of the technology is going to be different. It's not for individual profit or benefit. It's for the whole of society. It's for the whole of mankind and the planet. And that's completely different. Another point that uh, Nicholas uh, asked about was that division between private and public life. Some people, when they think about China, they think about those Maoist uh, uniforms that everybody had to, to wear. And when I was in China, it was also still very much like that. People all wore the same clothes. For people in the West, the idea that everybody's going to have to be the same, everybody's going to have to wear the same things, live in the same houses. This is another point you can emphasize that a resource-based economy is a lot different. There's houses you can order to be made exactly how you want. You can wear your own clothes, you can read whatever you want, you can, if you want to have a religion, you can have a religion. There is complete freedom as far as your private or your self-actualization. It's not so much private or public, but what people can do to become the best that they can become. Uh, another tricky point has to do with uh, the fact that Marxism and communism were both based on armed revolution and class struggle. And the big question that a lot of people have is, how is a resource-based economy going to come into place? Uh, Jacques himself never really said very much about transition in what I've been able to see. In fact, he says in the frequently asked questions that most changes of governmental forms, or rev pardon me, revolutions have come about through natural disasters, uh, collapses, uh, that sort of thing. And I think that's sort of an interesting look at history. I've never seen any government, <laughs> governmental form or anyone give up power willingly. Most changes of power, forcible changes of power, come about through violence. So 
I, 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 this is a question still for me. Yeah, uh, can we come back to it at the end when we've gone through all of these, Sammy? Um, now, as far as it also related to this is the fact that both of these revolutions took place um, uh, during a world war. Uh, so that means there's going to be a significant amount of the population that have weapons. So how is an RBE going to deal with this? These are some interesting questions. Also, having control of the army were major uh, positive factors for the communists to take over power. So again, these are considerations that might come up. Uh, another point, which I think is also worth thinking about, is that in looking at the history of communism, we have seen that different interpretations of Marx's doctrine led to a division uh, within the party and power struggles. So now, especially that Jacques has passed away, um, there are various uh, uh, groups that advocate a resource-based economy. So how is it possible that these groups are all going to work together? Um, the use of language has to be addressed. So I hope I've filled you in on how holism is used uh, in the resource-based economy sense. And symbiotic is another word that uh, Jacques uses frequently. Actually, there are three forms of symbiosis and um, it's important to be clear on exactly what form we live in now and what form of symbiosis we can live in in a resource-based economy. The final big question, I think, for advocates of the resource-based economy is how to deal with the hard problem. That is the question of consciousness. Uh, most of science sort of avoids consciousness as an area of study. Uh, consciousness can't really be defined, uh, but it comes up in all kinds of areas. So this is an area where the scientific method could be perhaps applied uh, that people would be able to relate to the RBE better. But that's just my own thing. Last point on these communication things is again non the importance of nonviolent communication. So, um, Sammy, you wanted to say something about uh, one of these points. It's about uh, nonviolent and violent. Is is you know how these um, two? Yes. Um, as I said again, I'm not an expert, but as far as I, I know that the um, communist communism and socialism was one thing in history before they split and how they split was socialists said that we will take the power as i said this is all about power structure who will have the decisions who will make who will govern who you know slave from coming from feudalism who will control who he will exploit and can we have an equal society so as I know, the socialists said we can take the power with voting, with the political, already existing political structure, and communists said, no, this is not the way to go. We will make um, with violence, like uh, the French Re Revolution did, with military, with force. So I think at the beginning, this was the split. And then communism in Russia take with the the military kind of you know with kind of violent takeover and then when it became the fascism everyone said communism is fascism kind of right this is, so this is this is only spread there is no fundamental difference with the goal of socialism and communism the the, the goal is the same to give the power to people make them equal so no one exploits other decisions are made by people right so that, that, that was about it and about 
um, what I was going to say about the, um, what was it? The, at the beginning that, um, Faulty logic? No, I was coming to something that uh, it was about um, at the beginning that we said I, I want to talk about this and that. Yeah, you said some. Uh, yeah, I only remember that you said you wanted to talk about uh, 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 the violent uh, revolution. Oh, yes, okay. So, yes, and the, exactly the violent revolution, Jack Fresco as well said that we can't have violent re revolution because why, for example, the French revolution started with violence and the people was only, they were not informed, but they, with instinct, they knew that they are controlled and they didn't want to be controlled. So that was the force pushing the new revolution, but they didn't know what it should be, what is the alternative, right? And then they had the capitalism because they didn't know the, they were not informed. They didn't have um, information. So I think the real revolution comes with information, not with violence. We, we, we will, yes, this is maybe the part of it, but after that, to be successful, we need informed people, education about this RB. That's why I am promoting RB in Facebook. I'm sharing information that this is the bad things about capitalism. We must be the, so education is the real thing. The, the people must understand we are going this direction. Because yeah. after, I, I afraid if some, something like this happens, you know, just military or something, that people are exploiting, we are 1% uh, is, you know, we are 99% whatever, and then, and then something happens, we can go back again easily. Like after feudalism, capitalism came, maybe after capitalism, something else that is exploiting us can come because yeah. they're not informed, they don't know about it. Right yeah, I, think, I think you're right there, but the, the, the problem is, I mean, I, I brought up the thing about world war, and I mean, if you look at, if you look at this idiot Trump, for instance. Ah, forgot about it, it's just, <laughs> it's a game, it's, it's not real, forgot it. It's just the, uh, they, they try to distract the things, you know, it's, it's not real. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Forget okay. about it. Okay, any, uh, anyone else want to respond to this or any of the other uh, considerations? Well, I don't yes. know if it helps, but um, uh, Samith uh, stated in the beginning he wants to talk about non-violent communication and violent communication. I don't know if it helps. Is, is that right? Sami, did you want to say something about non-violent communication? Well, yes, definitely. This the nonviolent communication. I think the only form of communication. The other is not communication. The other is dictatorship. The other is do what I want. The communication is nonviolent communication. So this is the only information. Give the information. If you can't, if the other side don't understand, you can't do anything about it. So you you try to make it more clear. You try to show the problems. If they don't see it. You can't force. If you force it, it comes back. It, it, does, it doesn't accomplish anything nice. So that, that's... And I, I know when I, was, uh, when I was making this presentation also, I thought, well, I've never seen any uh, change of power without violence. But then I thought about the Indian Revolution and uh, Mahatma Gandhi and passive resistance. Passive resistance, yeah. Yeah, and then I thought of Martin, but, Luther, Martin Luther King. Yeah, but yeah. It, the, 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 the passive is not forcing. It yeah. teaches something. To the, yeah. it, it just says, I am here, you see, you must learn something. I'm not forcing you, but you must, you must see our situation. You must see, you know, just, and I think in the population, the other, for example, the UK was forcing India into something. The UK yeah. population, the, the Gandhi was trying to wake up the sleeping ones in the UK population, not the forcing ones, but he was silent for the others, not for the, you know, so it is, 
it's a form of communication as well. Being silent is the, there is a most powerful form of communication. So being silent is maybe wakes up someone somewhere, but yeah. not always. Well, <laughs> who knows? Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Anyone else want to say anything? I know it was a really long presentation, so I don't want to keep uh, going on too long, but I'm open to anyone that wants to make any comments or ask any questions? Uh, I might do. Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, first, uh, I want to, to congratulate you for your wonderful presentation. It was uh, really, really good in the point that you focused the issues, uh, but not taking too long uh, on on some uh, of the issues and the things inside it. Uh, I think you, you managed quite well the, the, the time, in, 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 despite uh, it took uh, a bit long, but uh, you focused where you had to focus and uh, didn't uh, waste too much time uh, on the subjects as, as in my point of view. Uh, the, the question I want to ask you, Charlotte, uh, is a question that arrived to me uh, in uh, last week um, discussing with a friend of mine. He's an educated uh, person because he has a, a company. He's also, uh, he's all, also an engineer and he's uh, quite uh, understand with uh, the meanings of uh, the society like uh, logic uh, and uh, some of the technology. One of the questions he um, arises, in, and I might, I might add uh, that um, I had a quite long uh, for uh, maybe six hours of all put together uh, talking with him about the RBE, but I never uh, actually questioned, questioned him about what he thought. What he thought. Um, I was. Uh, in a conversation, just just uh, give him the ideas, the technology capabilities, the scientific capabilities, the problems we have in society. But last week, he by himself arises to to to, to this um, to this question: How how do we uh, mainly in the transition period? How do we uh, can manage to? Uh, Price people, um, give some more to people uh, for those who really uh, kind of uh, have a job. Um, we know for sure that uh, there uh, is no need for uh, lo lots of people to uh, do anything in terms of a job, but um, mainly in the transition period, it will be necessary for people to work. And his questions will be. How can you do that uh, if you can have money? How can you have uh, uh, put a prize or give something back for the person who um, has his time and offer his his job? And that's that's a question I would. Yeah, there's a there's a couple of uh, uh, things about the transition. Like uh, like I've said, you know, transition. There is no real clear plan as far as we know. But there's a lot of things uh, arising spontaneously in society, um, which may be uh, indications. One of the things, we're going to be having a, a presentation, uh, when is it, the beginning of September, on cryptocurrency. Now, you might remember that Leo and Alexander talked about using cryptocurrency in their city, in the, their solid base. Uh, for an RBE. Uh, I've been looking a little bit into cryptocurrency myself. I don't know much about it, but I'm thinking, hmm, I've put some uh, good articles on the uh, Moving Forward uh, Facebook page about cryptocurrency. You can find them uh, in the discussion on the meeting for the 3rd of September. That's one thing. You're seeing a lot of different groups that say, we're going to build a town and when we build it, people are going to come. This is not the official line, but people are doing, any, doing it anyway. Um, you have, uh, uh, what's another? Oh, yeah. 
I was I read something else by uh, somebody on uh, Facebook. I invited him to give a presentation. Uh, maybe I'm not saying this correctly, but it's called copiosis. Anyone know about this? Yeah, and uh, that apparently is some other system, which this RBE supporter said might be a transition form. So you know, I don't have any real answers. I suggest throw it into the uh, TVP uh, international support page, for instance, see what people say there. Uh, there are a lot of different things going on about transition. Yeah, and uh, Tony knows also there's groups coming together with the World Summit and the World Party. You've got the Money Free Party in New Zealand. There's all these initiatives going on. And nobody knows exactly how it's going to work out, at least I don't yet. But I think it's important for me as an open-minded RBE supporter to find out as much about these different things as possible. Uh, like Semi says, you know, education, that's the thing. We have to be the ones that are the most educated because we have to tell other people when they ask us questions. Uh, you wanted to add something, Sammy? Yes, about the copiosis. Is if someone no wants to know the basics, that it is in kind of in between our recent situation and the RB. It is um, because RB is all about function, the giving the needs of the people and then building up. So the copiosis it says the food and the shelter and everything should be no discussion. It will be given. And afterwards, if you like more luxuries, you can have them with some kind of currency, with some kind of points. So this is in between the resource-based economy. And, but I, I think it is a good alternative to this like uh, transition. Yeah, and that, that reminds me of one other thing I wanted to say. And then you wanted to say something, Tony? No? Uh, yes, yes, I did. OK, just one minute. I just wanted to add one thing. Uh, I saw this brilliant uh, film uh, about universal basic income uh, a couple of weeks ago, and he said people complain about a universal basic income because the, we're, giving, we're giving people money to do nothing. He said, there's no reason we have to do that. We're, in the new society, we're going to need to stay calm. We're going to need to get along with each other. We're going to have to have harmony. Why don't we pay people to come up with ideas about how to have a harmonious situation? And they can earn the UBE this way. I said, wow, now you're talking. This, this is an idea that I can go behind. So there's a lot of different ideas out there. And I think, you know, the more that we can listen to them, just use the scientific method, see, okay, what looks good, what doesn't, Support, you know, that's what I'm thinking. Tony, you wanted to say something? Uh, yeah, yes, I did. Um, no, I agree. First of all, thank you for the presentation. Brilliant. I loved it. Um, yeah, well, what I wanted to say was I don't think that any one group has a solution. I think it's a combined effort of everybody um, to, to come forward with, with the perfect solution because not everybody wants the same, but they all have the same focus. Um, uh, something I wanted to add, but I've got a question for you, Charlotte. Um, when you mentioned uh, the armed forces and uh, RBE and revolution in one sentence, and you have your doubts about that, um, don't you think that um, in the 50s and 60s the media was more conditioning towards people on how, how bad communism was, for example, it was done in movies, etc., etc.? Uh, but now, uh, in this day and age, people have become a lot more open-minded. Uh, there is a lot more um, uh, media attention. There's been a lot more protests uh, over the last uh, decades. And uh, people seem to have come together in a non-violent kind of way. Um, do, do you think that, that might actually be the next revolution, a non-violent revolution? I would certainly hope so. I, I, let me clarify why I keep coming back to this, uh, this idea of violence. It's not because I think that um, 
RBE supporters want to have armed revolution. In fact, I think everybody that wants a better new society is against armed revolution. But you know who supports armed violence? The people who have money and power now. My whole question is just what is going to happen if, if, okay, there's social collapse, there start there are riots in the street, the police are gonna come out, the people are gonna get killed, uh, and fascist states may be uh, 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 <clears throat> brought about. Uh, what are we gonna do then? So this is the only reason that it's of any kind of importance, any kind of interest to me, it's because I don't trust the people who have the weapons now. Absolutely, I, I agree with that. Um, uh, the, the thing is, uh, it, it's the people that control everybody else at the moment, like the corporations. Um, I mean, uh, America spends something like a million dollars a minute on their, um, uh, on their um, uh, defense contracts and God knows what. Uh, it, it's absolutely ludicrous. who are you actually fighting for? This was a long, long time ago when I wanted to do that um, because I, I've, I was in the army myself. And now I think uh, most of them, and like the veterans came to Standing Rock. Uh, you guys know about Standing Rock, about oh, the, the oil really pipeline. Yes, yes, yes. The, the veterans turned up and went like, you know, no, th this, is, this is wrong. Uh, so uh, I'm kind of hoping uh, my, myself that, that we can come to a kind of an agreement, even with the armed forces, because at the end of the day, when the moms and dads and the brothers and sisters are joining uh, or, or, or joining a, a, an RBE, then a soldier would not turn their gun to their own family. Yeah. And this is a very clear message. This is what I think that a nonviolent revolution it is the ne next thing. It's kind of a soft coup d'etat, you could say. Very, very good point. Thank you for bringing that up. And, and when you say that, I have to remember also in China with the uh, uprising in Tiananmen Square, that incredible picture of that student standing in front of the tank saying, stop, and he stopped the whole army. And I'm thinking of uh, Vias uh, for Vendetta, when the armed forces, when they don't have anyone to tell them to shoot, they just let the people come. So that's a nice point. Sammy, you wanted to uh, add something to that? Yes, I mean, uh, in, in a more kind of soulless, I mean, with uh, more, if, if you take the humanity out of it, just, just for the sake of argument, just for, for the science, the, the, what is the goal? The, the goal is to maximize the happiness of people, to, for, to minimize the suffering of everyone. So the transition, you say if it must be violent or not. So if you say that the, you say the, the one person can use the violence to control other people and prevent the happiness of all, to, to continue this suffering. So it is about the, the balance. If, if in the short term, the people suffer most people, you know, they, they kill, some deaths happen, and then afterwards the transition happens, and they, then they will get informed, and this RB will be implemented, and we'll be, we'll be all happy or whatever. And if this is better, then this system continues uh, to suffer to the poverty of deaths of to, to, uh, 20,000 children each day, dying from hunger or whatever, right? If this is better than that one, I will say let's, let's have, have it with the violent thing. But <laughs> who can say after the violent thing, just hitting in the head and let's change it, that it will be all good, it will be all that we could inform the people and other. I hope the best is to inform people and have the transition 
that way. This is the op op this is the utopia. You know, right. It's possible. It's possible. <laughs> it is possible. Yes, yeah, not utopia. Sorry, I just run the so, so, exactly. I, I <laughs> It's, he can't. It's ideal, not utopia. Sorry, ideal. None of that ideal transition. <laughs> not utopia talking. This is the ideal transition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but I don't know if, like, there there were revolts about capitalism and the fascism came and they say no, you can't change it. Should we respond with force? Maybe I don't. I don't know. This was this is a hundred years old question. No one knows about the the answer. It is. Well, it is I, think, I think it would be really the best. I think the the, the situations that we've cited about uh, what happened at Standing Rock with the veterans that that was really really beautiful. You're getting also in the United States. You're hearing more more and more people from the army that are saying. <laughs> Those are not your enemies. Uh, yes. Yeah, there's definite but, possibilities that it's not necessary. But then, then it means these people are informed. But yeah. what if the people are not informed that uh, they stay ignorant and stay still, they don't know about the RB and they, do, they still try to be selfish or whatever, if you yeah. can inform them. So share these videos, tell people about these meetings. Let's exactly. get people educated, yeah? If, this is the real reform is with information, not with violence. I think the reform is with information. Yeah. That's, yeah. yeah. If nobody has anything pressing to ask or say, I'd like to round off for tonight. Um, it's already quarter, it's two hours and 15 minutes. <laughs> so, uh, um, yes. Sorry, Charlotte. Uh, I, I, I think, I believe I do. Um, uh, although it's uh, a kind of important uh, comment, I think it will be uh, also a short one. Um, um, in your in your uh, last table, comparing in one column uh, the capitalist uh, system we have and the other column RBE, uh, one no, of those the, items. The one, sorry, sorry. The one column was socialism and communism, and the other okay. one was RBE. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, in the point there, you uh, started uh, to suggest that a product uh, could be evaluated uh, uh, regarding the, um, his abundance on the earth, his impact to the economy, his impact to the environment, and so on. Mm -hmm. That can be and uh, could be um, ex extendable to how we can uh, uh, evaluate the, how a given person could be rewarded by the work um, related to the question I uh, previously mentioned, uh, related to uh, their work. It could, it could be also, in the same way, uh, evaluated if a given person given a, a certain kind of job uh, with a certain amount of time and uh, capability and skill could be more access to uh, resources than uh, anyone else, other people. Then I think that could be also be determined. And uh, my answer with, uh, to my friend who was in that sense. Okay, yeah, that's, uh, that, uh, again, yeah, using that kind of uh, evaluation like I talked about uh, in the, um, I think it was the discussion of the economic arguments, uh, yeah, using, uh, by, by seeing uh, who makes the uh, best use of the resources would then uh, be given more access to them. This is this uh, not quite sorry, sorry, not not, uh, not quite Charlotte. Who uh, um, gives more input to the RBE, uh, as you can say, uh, should uh, have more access and quantify that access to that person. That would measure uh, how a person will be willingly to help. Willing yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to, as a as a sort of uh, as a sort of transition, you mean? Uh, uh, 
But even in the in the ORPE applied, uh, I, I don't think uh, I have uh, some kind of reservations. Uh, we can assure that no one would uh, have to work whatsoever. But I'm not comfortable with that. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, I think that sounds uh, that that's I think something we can look at more in detail in a different presentation. Uh, possibly something that you want to investigate yourself about uh, work relations, uh, etc., in an RBE. But uh, I, I don't really have the resources to answer that. So if you don't mind, I'd, I'd like to close uh, the meeting now because I'm pretty yes, worn out. <laughs> I, I'm pretty worn out. So. Uh, uh, the film is going to be on our uh, YouTube uh, site. Um, uh, I've got the presentation on the Facebook page. Our meeting in two weeks is going to be with a presentation by Andrew on changes, uh, automation, and changes in the workforce, uh, in the work vectors. Uh, next Sunday, we're having a social meeting, so that's just getting to know each other. So that's relaxed, no presentation, we just get to talk. And in September, the one on uh, cryptocurrency. And the other one in September is from Nicholas, who's going to be talking about in, in, uh, automation and artificial intelligence, all that stuff. So we've got a really lot of in, uh, good topics coming up. So keep the page and the events in mind. I wish you all very, uh, very great thanks for being here, for staying with me for the whole presentation, and hope to see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye to you all. Bye-bye.